Good evening and welcome to The Journey Home. The theme for tonight's program is one that is a theme that we often talk about in our programs. It's maybe the key theme to The Journey Home series, and that's the fullness of the Catholic faith. We're talking about maybe the most important reason that so many consider the Catholic Church the home that they are to come home to, and that's to experience and to appreciate the fullness of the faith. My guest for this evening is Professor Robert Lewis Wilkin, he is the William R. Keenan, Jr. Professor of the History of Christianity at the University of Virginia. He's a well-known author and speaker and a well-loved professor, and I consider it a great privilege to have him on the program. He's going to share his journey from the Lutheran pastorate into the Catholic faith, and he's chosen his topic, the fullness of the faith. Now, remember, your questions are an important part of our program, so if you have any for Professor Wilkins, please Call them in at 1-800-221-9460, or if you'd like to send us an email, it's journeyhome at EWTN.com. Professor Wilkin, welcome, welcome to the Journey Home program. I mentioned to the audience that you teach now at University of Virginia, but you have a, a, a history of teaching in Catholic institutions. In fact, you told me that there's a first that you're known for. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I was teaching at a Lutheran seminary uh, in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, 1964 through 67. And uh, I used to go back through the countryside to the Jesuit Theologate, uh, Woodstock. <laughs> which many people know about. Oh, and uh, For another reason. <laughs> well, this is another Woodstock. Oh, okay. This, this, is, <laughs> this was a, a, a very distinguished uh, Jesuit seminary uh, set back in the woods of Maryland. And it was about an hour drive through the woods, and I would go there to use their library because they had a lot of European journals that I was interested in. And I got to be friends with some of the Jesuits, Avery yeah. Dulles and... and uh, John Courtney Murray was there, I think, at the time, and uh, um, oh, a couple of other people, Gus Weigel. Yeah. And um, through my contacts with them, I got to be friends with some people from Fordham University in New York. And in 1967, Fordham was building a new faculty and decided that they would like to have a non-Catholic. And so I was appointed, really, as the first non-Catholic to have a regular appointment in a Catholic theology and department. In a Catholic theology department. And it was front page news in the New York Times uh, at, at the time. So that maybe had some influence on uh, the fact that... <laughs> well, I think having taught in Catholic institutions, because then I went from there to Notre Dame, and uh, actually with a brief stint at the Sulpician Seminary in Baltimore. So I really spent... Uh, well, almost 20 years, actually, in, in Catholic institutions. And how long have you been at the University of Virginia? I've been uh, for about 13 years. Is that right? Mm -hmm. so. And we'll talk a little bit later, but you teach a lot of patristics. Yes, right? the, the study of the Church Fathers, the great teachers of the Church during the first five or six centuries. Uh, St. Augustine, okay. St. Ambrose, St. Jerome, St. Athanasius, St. Cyril of Alexandria. Okay. The, uh, the great founding teachers and, and saints of the church. Well, many of our guests have said that their reading of the patristics were the stepping stone that brought them an interest in the Catholic well, It's certainly faith. been a factor for me. Oh, well, we'll talk a little bit more about that. Maybe begin, as we usually do each week, to invite you to share, if you would, maybe the early part of your spiritual journey. Well, um, I had the good fortune of being brought up in a, uh, a Lutheran family, uh, a family that was uh, very serious about their uh, Christianity. Uh, our life uh, really revolved around the church and my father's business. My father was often president of the congregation mm -hmm. and uh, he would say sometimes after he'd been president for three or four years it's time now to go and work for Wilkin again. And, <laughs> and uh, so the pastor was often in our home and, and through that influence I, I uh, was led by the Spirit to, uh, to study for the Lutheran ministry. Mm -hmm. And uh, I went off to prep school in Texas, leading a kind of minor seminary, hmm. to use the Catholic yeah. um, language. Then I went on to Concordia Seminary in St. Louis, and I came under the influence of a, um, a man by the name of Arthur Carl Peepcorn, who, who really had a, an appreciation of the, the richness of Catholic uh, liturgy and piety and sacraments, and uh, realized that this was an important part of the Lutheran tradition. Uh, also, growing up as a Lutheran in New Orleans, where I, where I did grow up, um, Lutherans and Catholics, in a way, looked very similar if you were a Baptist. <laughs> you know, you had a high altar, you had an altar rail, you had a, a sung liturgy, uh, you 
wore vestments. Uh, and so I think very early on I was, I was very much attracted to the, mm -hmm. the, the sacramental and liturgical life of the church and that really grew during seminary. And then I uh, graduated from seminary and, and went to the University of Chicago where I began to study the church fathers because my Lutheran professor said if you want to be a theologian, he didn't say go study Luther, <laughs> even though he had great respect yeah. for Luther, he said you should study the church fathers. Mm -hmm. and, so gradually, I think my own understanding of Christianity was, was being deepened both experientially, that is liturgically and sacramentally, and intellectually. And uh, that really then, I think, began to yeah. sort of force me to, to think more about what the relation was between Lutheranism, which really was a reform within the Catholic tradition, and the fuller Catholic tradition that had existed for 1,500 years. From your particular position as maybe a particular kind of Lutheran, mm -hmm. because there, there are many different That's perspectives true. on That's Lutheranism true. as there are in many different uh, aspects of other Christian traditions. Our theme is the fullness of the faith. Mm -hmm. And how would you have addressed that? as a Lutheran pastor, as a Lutheran seminary professor, would you have thought of what you taught as a Lutheran, the fullness of the Christian tradition? Well, the Lutheran way of putting it, which is a, um, a very good and, and full way of putting it, is that the church is centered on the, the word of the gospel and the sacraments. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I think that, that that carries one a long way. Mm -hmm. and, that for me then was a way of penetrating more deeply into the fullness of the mystery of the church. Mm -hmm. But what I think I began to feel was lacking was a larger sense of the tradition of the church, that, that the church had been a continuous community for centuries, and even though Luther is, is really one of the great teachers of the church, uh, if one is constantly using Luther as a point of reference, someone who is, who is trying to interpret over against as yeah. well as within the continuity of the church, one tends, I think, to get a partial perspective. Mm. And so I began to become more interested in medieval thinkers and then the patristic thinkers and to realize that, that there were there were hundreds or <laughs> dozens of major figures who would become then part of my own. And, and also I think um, one of the things that, that um, I began to sense within Catholicism, there was a kind of an intensity about the spiritual life. Mm. Uh, Lutheranism has a strain of that, but um, Lutherans are not as deeply engaged in uh, the spiritual pursuits. Mm. Well, that's not the best way. In, in, in terms of spiritual writing and moving into the depths of the spiritual life that the great spiritual writers are, uh, there's a sense that um, um, the emphasis on justification seems to predominate yeah. over these the other ba dimensions. The so it was, it was more a, a sense of a, of a larger sense of what the Christian mm. life could be. Um, monasticism was a factor, actually. I think um, um, that actually got you moving more yeah, seriously. Yeah, I think, I think when I was teaching at Notre Dame, I think for the first time I really began to know men and women, and especially some of the women who were religious women. And I was very much attracted, even though I was married, I wasn't attracted to monasticism as such. I think it was the contemplative side that 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 men or women could devote their lives solely to the pursuit of God in prayer and that that would be a satisfying life. That, that was something that was hard to, to fit within. Lutheranism had a place, but it was more instrumental. You know, you would be a celibate because then you could serve the inner city or be a foreign missionary. But this was a completely different way of understanding that, that one could actually turn wholly to God in prayer and that kind of a life would be satisfying and it would be one that the church would support. I was thinking as you're saying that, that somewhere in that Reformation process, this whole idea of the dedicated, celibate, religious, contemplative life mm -hmm. was kind of thrown out with the bathwater. Yes, I think 
it wasn't a matter of principle, but in fact, that's what happened. Hmm. And so uh, monasticism really lost its reason for being within Lutheranism and within the Reformed churches. It was kept on to a certain extent within Anglicanism, but not really. And uh, to put it another way, within Catholic life, there's a much greater texture because you've got many different forms of life, whereas in the normal Protestant parish or congregation, you basically have lay people and you have the pastor. But within Catholicism, they're all, and, and th they present other ways to live, more radical ways. Uh, you may not want to live that or, way, right. but you, you realize that these people have chosen to live a way which okay. always is before you as a, as a model or an example and a challenge. We start expanding that to talk about the fullness, and we think about the important place that the prayers of those contemplative Mm. monasteries and men and women, how they uphold the church in all its ways, mm. and uh, we don't, we can't make a comment on the lack of those in other denominations, but we can't help but think that there's a great void there. Well, I think um, another thing that uh, I, I began to pray the breviary, mm. what's now called the Liturgy of the Hours, long before I became Catholic. You started praying it in Latin then originally? Well, I started playing in English, and more recently I uh, have grown dissatisfied with especially <laughs> uh, the hymns and uh, some of the antiphons, and so I started going back to the Latin breviary, mm. which, which we also have in the new yeah. uh, Liturgia Orarum. But I think um, one realizes in praying the breviary or the Liturgy of the Hours that you are part of a community of people, lay as well as religious, who are engaged in this all over the world. And within Lutheranism, there was nothing like that. I mean, mm. we did have matins and vespers, but basically there were occasional services mm. that you would have for special occasions. But you didn't have the regularity. And, and prayer is, is about regularity. It's about habit. <laughs> you know, it's not about uh, a, a, an impulsive action. That may be one form of prayer, but the prayer that counts is the prayer that's mm. habitual and regular. And I think that's daily discipline. the daily discipline right. of, of prayer. Now, in your journey from the Lutheran pastorate and then the Lutheran academic to the Catholic faith was, was a jump and that revolved, involved a certain sacrifice and a certain difficult choice. And what was it in the midst of that journey? I mean, there's the traction of the fullness, the, the monastic uh, contemplative experience. The history, the tradition. But what was it? that then was able to kind of give you that kick to make that big step. That was a big step in your own journey. Well, um, it was a long, gradual process. Uh, some of my best friends uh, had uh, made similar decisions. It was something I had been thinking about for many years. Um, I think that um, the witness of this present pope was a factor. I think the church's social teaching um, on abortion uh, would be uh, one of the uh, factors. But I think that, um, if I can put it somewhat boldly, I think the question really became whether one wanted to be in communion with the Church of the Apostles. Now, I have to explain that because um, the point is the Church of the Apostles, the community that traces its history to the Apostles. There are many Christian communions who have apostolic doctrine, the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed, the, the basic teachings of Orthodox Christianity. But I don't think that that's what Catholicism is fundamentally about. It is about that, yes. but it's being part of the community that is continuous through history, going back to the Apostles. It's a sacramental thing. We have to remember that Christ comes to us not primarily through ideas, but through things, bread and wine, through persons, things that you can touch and you can see. And so we don't sort of come to Christ by leaping through the, the air with our intellects. We come through a community of people who have been themselves in intimate relation with him. And so the church, 
the community is the most significant thing that the incarnation brought mm -hmm. about, that a community came into being that was different. And only the Catholic Church and the Orthodox Church think that way. I mean, they, they think that way, they act that way, they talk that way, they believe that way, they're convicted that way, that there is no interruption. And the way to Christ is not by going through a set of ideas, but it is by becoming part. Because Christianity is, is about learning, again, habits, about learning to live a certain way. And the way you learn to live is by being with people who live a certain way. And so you have the saints and you have the great teachers of the past. And, so I, and that's what I mean by saying the, the, to become in to, to be received into communion with the Church of the Apostles. That's not in any way to depreciate those who emphasize the teaching. That's right. and I was going to say that when we talk about what is the fullness of what we're talking about, that's a good way of understanding it, because I know that from my own background, it was too easy to think if I'm being a faithful Christian, it's that I'm carrying this set of teachings faithfully. Right. What does it mean to believe? Well, I believe these right. things. That's, you, that's exactly the you know, point. And the point is, as you're emphasizing, that the fullness involves so much more. Even when Christ said, imitate me, mm -hmm. he didn't mean just repeat what I've told you. Right. It's a bigger picture. And it seems so obvious to me now, but I didn't see it before. Well, I mean, I think it, it is something that takes time to see, that becoming a Christian is not simply agreeing to a certain set of ideas. It's, it's taking on a certain way of life, and that has to be formed by a community. Now, there are other ways of talking about fullness. Um, Christianity is, is, is a religion about coming to know the living God. The living God is... is a mystery. That means that, that we don't know and then say, let's go on to something else. It's a matter of, Augustine says, we, we seek what we have found, and we find and continue to seek. He takes the psalm, Psalm 105, seek his face always. And he says, why does the other psalm say, those who seek the Lord rejoice, not those who find the Lord rejoice. And so the seeking is a finding, and the finding then is a seeking. And the fullness then comes to us in many different ways, through signs, through persons, through institutions, through ideas, through creation. And these signs then are never exhausted. It's, it's like getting to know a human being. You know, the more you get a, to know someone, the more mysterious they become. And so the fullness needs to be communicated not just in one way, not just through the mind, not just through the heart, not just through the moral life, you know, not just through a certain set of, of ideas, but through a community's fullness in life. When I think about the fullness of the teachings, I know that it's taken me a number of years after becoming a Catholic to truly appreciate some of those fullness things that um, it didn't. It, I didn't appreciate right off the bat. And mm -hmm. two things, also to fit into that fullness, is the importance of detachment. I mean, that's not just believing and, and loving it, but but also that, as you talk with the monastic, the detachment from things, the mm -hmm. moving away from, the, the accepting the emptiness so that Christ can fill us, but also the importance of humility. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's like there's a great virtue that I think I never considered, or the, one of the three theological virtues. We had a big emphasis on faith as a Lutheran, mm -hmm. and much of social gospel emphasizes charity. Mm -hmm. Where was hope? Mm -hmm. The great virtue, I don't think I ever remember even thinking about it before, mm -hmm. but an important part of that. Well, of that, that's actually, uh, uh, since you mentioned uh, the three theological virtues, faith, hope, and love, um, one of the things I think that the Reformation accented was God's love for us. Mm -hmm. But what one realizes is that within Catholicism, there is an equal emphasis on our love for God. And the first commandment is, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. That love toward God is, is the goal of the Christian life, and to be in fellowship with God is the goal. It's not simply 
to have been made right, but it is to enter into a whole new relationship, which is the relationship of love. So love becomes a, um, the key word. We're talking about moving towards the fullness right. and drawing people to the fullness of the faith. Today there's a, a common misunderstanding out there that's almost the other extreme. You know, I don't really need the church. It doesn't matter what church I'm in. All I need is Jesus. Well, how do you address that kind of a statement? Well, um, the question is whether you want Jesus, who is the Christ. There are many Jesuses. Uh, you know, there's the Jesus of Thomas Jefferson, the founder of my university. He spent his winter evenings one uh, year in Virginia going through the Gospels and taking out those parts of the Gospels that he didn't think really belonged. And so he got his Jesus. And then we had uh, Sheldon in his footsteps, uh, yeah. who basically portrayed Jesus as a, a businessman who uh, you know, went out and kind of made, uh, made a lot of money. And uh, um, so there are many Jesuses. Um, you know, there's a moral teacher. You know, there's Jesus, the kind and compassionate one. Well, the reason one needs the church is that you want to have the fullness of Jesus, which is the Christ, and not just your Jesus, your partial Jesus. You want to have the Jesus who is a human being who lives in our world and feels, I hate to say feels our pain, but feels <laughs> our, feels, um, uh, suffers as we suffer. But you also want to have the Jesus who is the resurrected Lord. You want to have the Jesus who is the, the divine Logos, who is the second person of the Holy Trinity. So, and that Jesus you will only get with the fullness of the church's teaching and practice and, uh, and not with um, you know, just a certain sort of conception. Um, the, the thing to, the, to keep in mind, uh, obviously, is Jesus is not an idea. Jesus is a living Person. reality, present now. And as human beings, it's very tempting for us to only take what we ourselves think we want or need. So we always have to be challenged to, to extend. So, I mean, there's no question. I mean, we've seen too many cases where Jesus then becomes, you know, something that pushes a cause. Uh, I was thinking of the little armbands that we see all over the WWJD. And what would Jesus do? Armbands. Mm -hmm. Well, that's one Jesus. That's and, and on the one hand, yeah. on the one hand, it's a great mm -hmm. incentive. What would yeah. Jesus do in this? Right. But the danger is who determines, and finally helps us know exactly what Jesus would do in very difficult situations. Mm -hmm. Is it left up to us to decide, or is there an authority that helps us know? Because sometimes <coughs> what Jesus would do involves a whole lot more sacrifice than I might be willing to make. And how do we know that that's a sacrifice he's calling us to? The fullness of the faith. Well, what we mean partially by that is that we recognize that our, our brothers and sisters of other Christian traditions have a part of that fullness, but maybe not all the fullness. And maybe they've included in some of their uh, traditions, some of their, uh, their own dogma, things that aren't necessarily a part of the fullness. Maybe things have been added on. A couple but I think, I think at that point one would want to say that um, there is a fullness that is presented to the Catholic Church that comes from other Christian communions. Uh, that is that Catholicism needs the rest of the Church the, as ca they need Catholicism. Uh, that is, we have things to learn. I mean, I think yeah. take the evangelicals, for example. I mean, yeah. here's a, a form of, of being Christian that is filled with vitality and life and dynamism today. And um, there's much there that we can learn about yeah. the fervency of Christian faith and the dedication and commitment. Um, there's mainline Protestantism in its classical forms had a, had a deep understanding of sort of the, the character of Christian faith. In some cases, it's political significance or it's moral significance. So fullness can be 
Put another way, that is the fullness that Catholics are able to appreciate because they have relations <coughs> with other Christian communities. It reminds me of a statement <coughs> from uh, the ecumenical document, Vatican II, where it said that whatever the Holy Spirit <coughs> has engraced in the hearts of our separated brethren is for our spiritual renewal. Right. And I recognize that, yes, indeed, the Holy Spirit can work out there. Now, that's <coughs> though why we need the teaching of the church to make sure that we recognize those things that are good out there and those things that aren't. And there's sometimes the danger. <coughs> and when we look at the fullness of what we would call the fullness of the, the Christian message of the, the Catholic truth, <coughs> why would you say that coming to the fullness is an essential endeavor? An why essential? is it essential? An essential endeavor. In other words, why would you <coughs> say Nan, that becoming a Catholic itself is something that you would encourage, let's say, a, a Lutheran or Episcopalian that might be watching our program? Well, um, uh, I don't, I'm not sure I would, I'd like to use the word encourage. Okay. I mean, uh, I mean, I think that that's probably not the word I'd want to use. Right. I mean, I think, uh, I think the answer would be uh, pretty much what I said before. It's, it's whether one wants to be in communion with the community of yes. people that identifies indisputably with the okay. apostolic tradition. I, I, let, me, let me bring in another specific here. I don't think that the Petrine ministry, the ministry of the Bishop of Rome, was a major factor in my becoming Catholic, though the person of this pope was. Yes. Uh, but three years ago, um, when I, I went to live in Rome for three years, and I, uh, for three months, and I lived at Sant'Anselmo, the Benedictine um, uh, house of studies and seminary there. And um, I think living there, I began to get a sense of the Catholicity of the church in relationship to Rome, and to realize how much the church needs a center. Hmm. That it, it's something that gives people a point of reference something that can hold together the many, many diverse parts of the church. Mm -hmm. So I think that this is something that Catholicism, that Orthodoxy does not have, and of course no form of Protestantism, and I think that Catholicism by having a papacy, and now a strong papacy, is able to give people a sense that the church is not just a historic communion, the popes go back for mm -hmm. centuries, and nothing else like that institution, yeah, right. but it's also a worldwide communion. Hmm. And you know, the Pope has bishops in from Thailand, you know, or from Nairobi, or <laughs> from Ireland, or you know, or from uh, the South Sea Islands you know, for regular visits. I mean, that's, that's an extraordinary uh, feature. And that's only really possible within Catholicism. Before we take our break, maybe a, a comment to the audience about if they want to discover the fullness. If you, from a practical standpoint, what, where might you encourage them to start? Well, I'd say, you know, start reading Augustine. <laughs> and now, actually, there is a new trans, uh, there's a new translation it's, uh, uh, of his works coming out from New City Press. It's a transplant of an Italian press called Nuovo Città, mm -hmm. and um, they, are published, they published all of Augustine's sermons. 11 volumes, that, huh? and I just, one of his, one just came out on his writings on marriage. That'd be one place to go. Okay. I'd say go to the catechism, yeah. you know, the catechism of the Catholic Church. Yeah. Uh, um, you know, read, uh, um, burn it. There, there are a lot of Cistercian writings that are now available from the Cistercian Publishing House. Uh, there, there are many places that one can go. I think one thing you had mentioned earlier when we talked was maybe visit a, a oh. Yes, I was going to say, I'd, I'd say one way to do it, yes, I, I, not to talk simply about the books, go visit a, a contemplative monastery, you know, on a Sunday evening for Vespers, 5.30, a Benedictine or a Cistercian monastery, and, um, and just observe. Uh, nothing more than that. I mean, then you begin to see a, a way of life that... Uh, uh, you're not going to find anywhere else. A very old way. The Cistercian just celebrated their 900th anniversary. Yeah, that's There's a continuous history. That's I mean, it's like a family. Yeah, that's the Benedictines the same way. Well, thank you, Professor. Before we take a break, a couple things. Uh, you'll see during the break, uh, uh, 
some information about two of your books. Mm -hmm. You've written many, but two of them. One of, is about remembering the Christian past. It's a series of lectures and articles you've written. And another book uh, called The Land Called Holy, mm -hmm. which is a, a bit about the Christian history of the Christian. But it's how the Holy Land, that is Palestine or Israel, became a holy land for Christians. So a Christian who's going to go there really sees it as a Christian history <coughs> in this country, not just a Jewish history. Very good. We'll be back in just a moment. <coughs> and we want to remind you that uh, to give us your phone calls and also emails. In case you'd like to email us, remember that that email address is journeyhome at EWTN.com. We'll back with you in just a moment. Welcome back to The Journey Home. My guest for tonight is Professor Wilkin. He's talking about the fullness of the faith. We've been discussing different aspects of that, the beauty of it. Uh, also, I'm glad you mentioned the fact that the, because the Holy Spirit does work through our separated brethren, sometimes it reminds us of maybe parts of the fullness we take for granted and maybe don't practice as well as we should. Uh, mea culpa, right? That, that old phrase, mea culpa, which I never said before as a Protestant until I became You Catholic. didn't have to say mea maxima culpa. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Are you telling me I should say that? <laughs> I said you didn't have to say that. <laughs> it was only a mea culpa, not a That's maxima. Right. <laughs> I'm always humbled when I have someone like you on the program. That's why I'm here and you're there. I'm the Cliff Cleveland of theologians, and I'm <laughs> glad you're here to answer the questions. In fact, let's take our first, the fact, the first email that we're getting is one that I'm often asked. Mm -hmm. And I'm glad it was sent tonight. It says, Dear Marcus and Professor Wilkin, you have been speaking about reading the writings of the Church Fathers. You've mentioned books that were valuable assets and would be a helpful place to start to familiarize oneself with that kind of reading. Please give me the name of any such books or others you recommend and where they are available. Well, uh, there's probably no one book. Uh, I mentioned. There's actually lots, aren't there? There's so many. I mean, I, there's this new edition of Augustine's works by New City Press. Yeah. A good place to start with, with would be Augustine's Confessions, hmm. which is a nice new translation now by Henry Chadwick and uh, published by Penguin Books. Hmm. Um, uh, for Catholic readers who have access to the breviary, the Liturgy of the Hours, every day there's a reading, yeah. well-chosen reading from the Church Fathers or from the Medievals from Bernard. Um, there's an old translation, but still good, uh, called the Nicene and Post-Nicene Fathers that's available from Erdman's Publishing House and Hendrickson. Um, there Isn't there one by a Catholic University? Ancient Christian Writers, uh, the Fathers of the Church by Catholic University. Basically, if one goes into a bookstore in a seminary or a university, you probably could find some of these books. Uh, and the, the Christian book distributor that publishes a catalog um, mm. actually has some of these books. So. Uh, uh, Another is the Paulist series on spirituality. Oh, yes. Yeah, and those, actually there are probably 10 or 12 of uh, on the early church fathers and then on, and then maybe another 10 or 12 on the medieval. Some great women writers, mm -hmm. like Teresa. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm glad rigid. you mentioned the daily readings yeah. along with that because I, I think a lot of us take it for granted. And what's powerful about the daily readings, not only are they the writings for today, right? The, you know, here we are on Friday. This right. is that's the reading yeah. that we but today was from, from Irenaeus. Yeah, Saint Irenaeus. And every Catholic in the world is encouraged, united, right. to read and to meditate, and reflect, and to, and to follow and obey the suggestions that are in these great writings. And what a powerful place to begin. To I've spent my life reading the Church Fathers, but I'm constantly finding a phrase or a sentence mm -hmm. in these daily readings that I had not noticed. And then I go back to my own text and I find it and I say I hadn't really seen that until I read it in this context. It's a very powerful resource the Church has given us. Let's take our first caller for this evening. 
Hello, this is Pat from Texas. Hello, what's your question for us tonight? Hello, Dr. Wilkin, good evening. Marcus, it's always a pleasure to see you. Hello. I've been an Episcopalian for, well, too long. I mean, a, a long time. Uh, I'm in congestive heart failure and on oxygen and uh, have, have two, three boys that are 33, 32, and 30. And my wife, uh, who is 61, I'm 57, and I visited with a Catholic priest and I made the profession of faith. And I just feel that with my life ending, which, you know, it, I mean, congestive heart failure is not curable unless you get a heart transplant. I'm not, they're not going to, they're not, they're not going to, not going to be recipient. I think it would be the ultimate in, 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 in selfishness for me to, 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 to convert to Catholicism and leave my three boys who love me very much to be counseled by someone that they don't know, a funeral in a church that they've never set foot in, and uh, that, that's about as brief as I can be. Pat, thank you very much for calling. I mean, uh, I think the first thing I'm going to say is that we're going to keep Pat in our prayers and his family, because this is not an easy question or an easy situation to to be in, uh, Professor. Well, I, I think this is the reason I didn't want to use the word encourage before. Yeah. I mean, I, uh, I think that I have discovered with my friends and with myself that in the end it finally comes down to questions of family, to the most intimate, personal, familial relations that one has and the people around you. Yeah. And um, Given what we've already said about the other Christian communions, uh, I think that the reasoning of Pat uh, is sound. Mm -hmm. Namely, uh, um, I'll give you a, a completely different kind of illustration. The, the early desert fathers who were extreme ascetics, mm -hmm. one of them tells a story of someone coming in and um, wanting to uh, be an ascetic as well as this monk, and the monk says, well, let's have something to eat. And, uh, and he says, no, I don't eat, I don't eat, I don't eat. But he says, but you should eat because we're together. <laughs> and, uh, and that's a higher good. Love is a higher good than <clears throat> being an extreme ascetic. And it may be that for Pat, the higher good is the love for his family than what might find for him to be the most satisfying thing spiritually. It may be that, that it's a test. It's a test as to whether he is, you know, can love his family, and that means that he isn't able to fulfill his own, his own deepest uh, needs. And, you know, I appreciate your, your comment about our use of encourage, because I, even as I work with converts and potential converts all the time, uh, I don't want to over push them. Uh, it needs to be between them and the calling of the Spirit in their heart. So I don't want to manipulate them to push and pull. So maybe just two, just two comments to add to that for Pat. First of all, I'd strongly encourage you to talk to your local priest and get his spiritual direction on this very issue. You know, don't be afraid to talk to him about this. And I might also encourage you to not be afraid to talk about this to your family. To talk about this. Make sure you've talked about this with your wife. Let your boys know where you, where you feel on this. Pray about this. But. Uh, they probably, I know in my own situation with my family, sometimes it's hard for me to know where my father is at in his faith. I know that's a common uh, concern among folk, that fathers and sons don't often talk as freely as they would like to. There's never a better opportunity than maybe now to make sure you get a chance to share what the Lord is doing in your heart and your life. But again, I encourage you to get that local spiritual direction from your priest. We have another caller, so why don't we go this time to Martin in Florida. Good evening. What's your question for us this evening, Mark? Uh, hi, Marcus. I Hello. really enjoy your show. I have a question for your guest. Yes. Uh, my question is, uh, what is the difference in the understanding between the Lutheran and the Catholic understanding of the Eucharist? I'll hang up and I'll listen to your reply. Okay. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we need an hour-long program for yes, that. Yes. <laughs> um, Lutherans have traditionally uh, insisted with strong theological arguments that they believe in the real presence, and I think that is true. In that sense, 
Catholics and Lutherans are in agreement. Mm. Um, I think that um, traditional Lutheran piety was very high in the sense that there was a, a, a deep veneration and love of, of, the, of the sacrament. So I think it's less at the level of theological conviction or mm -hmm. theological understanding and more at the level of how the sacrament plays itself out in the life of the community. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that has happened over the last several hundred years is that within Lutheranism the frequency of communion declined. Mm -hmm. And the primacy of the preaching of the word in the gospel uh, was really raised up. And in recent years, there's been an attempt to try to rectify it. So that uh, the, the Lutheran is, is not as much formed by the regularity. Uh, many Lutherans still, the sacrament is, is an addition. It's not the, the daily, it's not the weekly fare, and it's certainly not the daily fare. Also, I think a significant difference is that um, there's a kind of objectivity about the sacrament within Catholicism because of the practice of reserving the sacrament. Mm -hmm. That when you go into a Catholic church, you have the sense that it's alive. Mm -hmm. There's something, someone there. Whereas in a Lutheran church, you don't have the sacrament being reserved. and so. You know, little gestures such as kneeling when you come into the church or going to the pew, these things are significant, I think, in, in the way in which one perceives these matters. So uh, it's, it's, it's less a matter. Now, a person who is a sacramental theologian would want to say a lot about the difference, and Catholics try to, to give a much more refined understanding of the nature of the real presence. But I think that where it really plays itself out is in the actual practices that, um, that define the different ways in which the uh, Catholics and Lutherans. Now, I was brought up Lutheran myself also. And I don't remember a whole lot from my childhood days as a Lutheran. But one thing later on when I was considering all this is that I don't remember as a Lutheran believing the, the transubstantiation understanding of, of what was, in other words, <coughs> I still believe that this was bread in my hand, but then in some very mysterious way, Jesus was also there. Whereas Catholics, we... we well, that's what I said. I think that it, 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 if one wants to go into the that definition, theological definition, Catholics will have a different way of defining it than Lutherans will, but the point is to say that what is present is the living Christ. Yes. I'll give you a, 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 a marvelous example. When I was in minor seminary, I had a, uh, an elderly Lutheran pastor who uh, was teaching us German. And we were studying one day the words in the, uh, of the institution narr narrative, this is my body, das ist mein Leib in German. And we were kind of rambunctious and we were just playing with him and we said, well, is doesn't really have to mean is there. It can mean signify. The next day he came to class, he didn't talk about German. He gave us an hour-long lecture on why is means is. <laughs> um, so for him, it was a matter of uh, the, the truth of the, of, the, of the gospel and of the sacrament. So I, I think... I think that, well, that, that one of the things that Luther just yelled over in one big. Well, that was the great issue, you see, yeah. uh, with the other with reformers against the Zwinglians, you see, and, and Luther. So, um. let's check uh, uh, our next email, if we would. This comes from Christian in Tacoma. Dear Professor Wilkin, I am in great agreement about your points concerning the incarnational aspect of the Christian community as a witness of Christ to the world, society, etc. Could you please? comment on the growing interest in the church's social teaching, the need for a more, quote, counterculture witness of the faith in society as, for example, communal, journal, different church movements, etc. The growing interest in the social movement. <coughs> well, I, I think that's been a, a major factor, um, certainly in my life and in many others, I think, who have come into, have been received in the full communion in recent years. 
and that is that, um, and I can relate it to what we were saying earlier. To be a Catholic is to say that we have received certain teachings and certain practices. And we begin with what we have received. Now, as time passes, what is received has to be interpreted, it has to be applied, it has to be adapted. And I think that Catholicism on the abortion issue, on homosexuality, homosexual marriage, on euthanasia and matters of this sort, has, has taken the position that this is what we have received and it is not our business to change in any fundamental way. And I think that within Protestantism, the question is put differently. It says, what does the church teach? And then you, you try to determine by discussion and argument and study the scriptures, the history of the church's teaching, present social understandings, what should be taught. I think there's a fundamental difference there. And I think that's why Catholicism has been able. Now, we've had, fortunately, an unusual pope <laughs> who has had the capacity, especially in Veritatis Splendor, to give uh, intellectual, theological, biblical grounding for fundamental matters of moral teaching. But I think that, um, and, and I think in this sense, um, he's become then a voice which is, um, uh, which stands above all others. Because he speaks with a kind of a confidence because he is teaching what he has received and issues are not simply open because there has been a profound social shift. And then you say, well, what should we teach now that we're in this social situation? We teach this because this is what we have received. Because, but we do know that, that things modify and change. It isn't as though there's a rigidity here. But there is a basis from which you start and then you, you stay um, with it. It seemed like I remembered, for, again, from my past that too often, uh, at least within evangelicalism, there's often an either or. There was the gospel, you know, living the truth of Christ, uh, believing the truth of Christ, going evangelizing, or there was the social gospel, as if they were not the same. Was well, that or. was a, a factor. And I find in Catholicism, it's a both and. It's very, it must be a both and. Yeah. It must be a both and. We see in the life of Mother Teresa and in the life of, of our own Pope. Mm -hmm. the, the need for, that they, in fact, I think what brought it strongly to me was that the parable about the sheep and the goats, you know. I mean, there we, we talk about the end judgment's gonna be based on how our commitment is lived out in our relationship with other people mm -hmm. and the significance of that. Right. I wonder if we have, I guess we don't have time to get one more, and I was, was hoping to. Uh, Professor, it is a great privilege to have you on the program. I think is maybe one last quick question. Just to, it gets back to, uh, again, a question I get so often the, about the early fathers. And you described earlier what the early fathers were, who they were, and you've centered so much of your life on teaching about the early fathers. Why are they so important for a person to know the early fathers, to hear the early fathers, to listen to the early fathers, for them to have a full appreciation of the Christian faith? It was the springtime of the church's history, and they blossomed you know, like a meadow in spring and everything was new. And another thing which is only being discovered now, they are so biblical. Everything they say. I mean, I should make this point. I think that becoming Catholic, I've become a much more serious reader of the Bible because of the breviary and because of the church. Father. Everything they say is drawn from and dependent on the scriptures. So there's a kind of a, sort of a freshness. That's one of the reasons why evangelicals love the church fathers. Because um, they bring it to life. And of course well, they're, because they, they're biblical. Yeah. They're biblical. And also because during that time, the great persecution. I mean, they had to live their faith under great stress. True. Professor, thank you so that much is. for being a guest. What a great privilege. And again, I encourage the the audience that may see during the break, again, uh, two of your books in case they're interested in finding out more about some of your writings. So please stay with us. We'll be back in just a moment for some closing words for The Journey Home.
we've been discussing the beauty of the fullness of the faith. And I thought I'd, as we close, I'd refer us to a scripture passage, and it's actually the context around the passage we referred to in one of the recent programs. It comes from Colossians chapter 1, verses 21 and following. Follow as I read. This refers Paul referring to his own ministry, but our coming to the fullness. And you who were once alienated and hostile in mind because of evil deeds, and there we all are, you know, because of our own sins, he now has now reconciled in his fleshly body through his death to present you holy without blemish and irreproachable before him. Christ's sacrificial death on the cross is to reconcile us to God so that we might be presented ourselves holy. But then he goes on, provided that you persevere in the faith, Firmly grounded, stable, and not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been preached to every creature under heaven, of which I, Paul, am a minister. Part of our journey of faith is holding tight to that which we have heard from the beginning. That's what John also says in 1 John chapter 2. Our call to hold faithful to the fullness of the faith. There's an important warning here. He uses the word provided that we persevere. There's no presumption that once we've become a member of the church, we're guaranteed somehow of eternity. It involves our constant journey. Professor Wilkin put it so well. It isn't that we've arrived, we continue to seek his faith, all of our, his face, all of our life. God is drawing us through the body of Christ, through the teachings of the church, through the witnesses of the saints, through the witnesses of our brothers and sisters. And he's calling us in that to persevere, to be faithful to what Paul says, the hope of the gospel that we've heard, the hope. I love the word hope because it reminds me so much of what our Pope tries to teach us. We look ahead to a future that may not look as hopeful as we might think. We look around us in this world, but yet in the midst of that, John Paul constantly calls us, be not afraid, be not afraid. Hold tight to the hope of the gospel that is within you, which has been preached to every creature. The goal of the church is to proclaim the fullness to all who are around us. And you know, that isn't just the job of the, those higher up in the church. The proclaiming of the gospel is our responsibility in our words and in our actions. Let's ask the Lord to always give us the courage so that in our lives and in our words, we can proclaim and live the fullness of the Catholic faith. God bless. See you again next week.